Ha! We back. The flat electrician, the most gangster politician ever, Cassius Marcellus Clay. Hit that like button, man. Y'all been running it up, so we're going to run it back. You know what I mean? We're going we gonna to drop some stuff. You know what I mean? Sprinkle, sprinkle. Let's get it. It's a riveting story. It was really good. All right, we got to go. We got to go. I got to tell the internet about the guy I named you after, okay? You got to go hang out with mom now. Oh, wait. Okay. Today we're talking about the most gangster politician in American history. Ladies and gentlemen, Cassius Marcellus Clay, a.k.a. the Lion of Whitehall. Whitehall being his family home that he grew up in in Kentucky as the son of one of the richest slave owners in all of America. While going to college at Yale to become a lawyer, he would attend a speech from a famous abolitionist by the name of William Lloyd Garrison, and that speech would change the entire trajectory of Cassius Clay's life as well as American history. It is at that moment that Cassius Clay decided he was not only going to be quietly opposed to slavery, but that he was actively going to fight against it. He would be set down the path to become the most influential abolitionist of all time. Oh God, forgot to do the ad, hold on. Sorry for bothering the video, real quick, this video is brought to you by the biggest sponsor of the channel and my favorite sporting goods store, Shields. They've got over 30 retail locations across the United States and an even better. I gotta say this, one time when I was in uh, high school, uh, I used to get Saturday detention all the time because me. So there was this lady who was my dean, Miss Richardson. Hey her. If you watching, I hate you. So <laughs> she not a good person. Um, but she lived in Oklahoma and she was like talking about Shields. And I knew what Shields was, but in prob nobody know what Shields is because we only got dicks. And she was like <laughs> she was like, I she was like, uh, what'd she say? She said, oh, I used to go to Shields, but I absolutely love dicks. <laughs> <laughs> and me and my boys was like. That's because that name, should they should change that name. Terrible name. But yeah, random. Sorry. Just random high school story better online store that I'm going to have linked down below. And if you use my code, you're going to get free shipping. They've got everything you can imagine there. This is where I got this shirt. It's where I got this backpack. All of it was on sale. It was a great deal. Again, use my code down below. You're going to get free shipping. Back to the video. That's fire. Oh, wait, Good hold sponsor. On. Uh, I forgot to mention Muhammad Ali's original name was Cassius Clay. Yeah, Gosh. he was actually named after this guy too. Anyways, back to the video. Bye-bye. If you don't know at this point in time, there's basically two different camps you could fall into for being anti-slavery. You could be an abolitionist or an emancipationist. An emancipationist is somebody that wants to vote it out over time over the next 5, 10, 20 years versus an abolitionist, which is somebody that believes we need to end slavery right now and they're willing to fight about it. And in the case of Cassius Clay, he was willing to fight anyone, anywhere, anytime. You see, Cassius Clay wasn't just some nobody punk kid that went off to college and decided that he didn't like slavery. This was the son of one of the wealthiest slave owners in all of America. So for him to come out and voice anti-slavery views, was a huge deal and it pissed off a lot of people. So being that this was the 1820s, what do you do when you're pissed off? You challenge somebody to a duel. So needless to say, the young Cassius Clay found himself partaking in an awful lot of duels and he never ever lost. So obviously he's pretty good at it. And what do you do when you find something you're pretty good at? You want to keep doing it, right? Yeah. Right. So Cassius Clay starts challenging anyone and everyone to a duel that dares to oppose him. It became common knowledge in his community that Cassius Clay would be willing to fight the wind if it blew from the west and he wanted it to blow from the east. This man went on a <laughs> dueling rampage so much so that by the time he graduated college, he was considered to be the deadliest duelist in all of North America. This guy was putting slave owners in the dirt like he was Johnny Appleseed planting fucking trees. He became known as the deadliest abolitionist of all time. So he graduates from college, goes back home as a lawyer. Shortly after that, his father passes away and leaves everything to Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay immediately frees all of his father's slaves, costing himself $40,000, which is roughly $2 million today. And then Crazy. he even gives some of the slaves land and money on top of it. Absolutely infuriating the pro-slavery people in Kentucky. So what do you shout do when half the local population? Nah, shout out to him because... Mm -hmm. Shout out to him freeing the slaves and putting them on. We he love that. with that. Good, good folks. Day. And then he even gives some of the slaves land and money on top of it. Absolutely infuriating the pro-slavery people in Kentucky. So what do you do when half the local population hates your guts? 
you run for public office. And that's exactly what Cassius Clay did. He served in the Kentucky State Legislature from 1835 to 1841, and then finally lost his reelection, to which the pro-slavery crowd breathed a huge sigh of relief because they finally defeated Cassius Clay, or so they thought. Clay immediately starts traveling the country, giving amazing anti-slavery speeches, winning over hearts and minds, and this absolutely infuriates the pro-slavery people because they don't know how to stop him. Fox. You can't legally stop a guy from talking to people that want to listen to him, and they can't legally kill Cassius Clay in a duel because he's the best duelist on earth. What do you do? You've got to illegally kill him. The problem with that is they can't find a hitman that's dumb enough to think that they can take out Cassius Clay, so they have to go to the one crevice of the planet where they can find somebody truly insane enough to think that they can do this job. And that man's name was Sam Brown, an assassin from New Orleans. 1834, Russell Cave, Kentucky. Cassius Clay's finishing up one of his world famous speeches as he pulls out a burlap sack, he reaches into the sack and pulls out a holy Bible and says, for those those of you that believe in the laws of God, I make to you this argument against slavery, sets the Bible on the table, reaches back in the sack, pulls out a copy of the U.S. Constitution, and says, for those of you that believe in the laws of man, I present to you this argument against slavery, sets the Constitution down on the table, drops a burlap sack to the ground and says, for those of you that believe in neither the laws of God or man, I make to you this argument against slavery, as he pulls out both of his pistols and sets them on the table, which I think we can all agree is gangster as and at this moment, Sam Brown comes up on stage and shoots Cassius Clay point blank in the chest. Luckily, Cassius Clay never leaves home without his trusted Bowie knife, which resides inside of a metal sheath. And that metal sheath would catch Sam Brown's bullet, saving Cassius Clay's life. At which point, Cassius Clay would draw his Bowie knife and charge Sam Brown. Six of Sam Brown's friends in the audience tried to stop Cassius Clay. He would fight his way through all six of them, making his way to Sam Brown, promptly stabbing him in the chest, and then turning him into a Mr. Potato Head by cutting off his nose lopping off his ear and gouging out one of his eyes then the six men talk we about, like him talk about an, uh bring a gun what is that bring a gun to a knife or bring a knife yeah. to a gun uh fight that boy did it and won and he was supposed to win because the the, the knife catcher got him oh yeah i know nah. if that happened to you you gotta know you gotta win that fight facts ain't no way that you gonna catch that and still gonna go no nah. You're I ain't gonna lie, fight. you survived the bullet and you able to catch the person that shot it, right. you gotta do him and back. And stab him with the, Boy, <laughs> the knife what? that caught it. That's I ain't a stabby stabby, but I'm gonna get the stabby stabby! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah, cause what? Yeah, yeah. nah, ain't Crazy. no way. Uh, That's crazy. Yeah, that is. That's fire, though. Bowie knife and charge Sam Brown. Six of Sam Brown's friends in the audience tried to stop Cassius Clay. He would fight his way through all six of them, making his way to Sam Brown, promptly stabbing him in the chest, and then turning him into a Mr. Potato Head by cutting off his nose, lopping off his ear, and gouging out one of his eyes. Then the six men recovered and were able to peel Clay off of him. Not knowing what to do, knowing they couldn't stop Cassius Clay forever, they panicked, probably for fear that Cassius Clay was going to start shoving this guy's facial features up his ass next. They did the only thing they could come up with to get the two apart. They picked up their friend Sam Brown, threw him over a seven foot high stone wall. He fell down an embankment and into a creek bed to finally get Cassius Clay away from him. Somehow, Sam Brown survived, but not only was he lucky for that, he was also dumb as because he then decided to take Cassius Clay to court because apparently after Cassius Clay stabbed him the first time, they were even on the whole assassination attempt thing. So Cassius Clay should go to prison for mayhem. So Cassius Clay calls upon his older cousin. One of How you going? Wait, Bruh. this is like what, 18 something? That's yeah. hilarious. This nigga a Karen. That's the first Karen. Yeah. What you talking about? With Sam Brown? Yeah, Sam Brown gonna shoot the bullet then call the cop, bro. No, you know what I'm saying? You got, you know. Uh, he didn't you know. even show a picture of him. I want to see what that fool looks like. I know. Live by the code, die by the code. Yo, you know what I mean? You gotta. Sheesh. That's like robbing a drug dealer. That's like you being a drug dealer getting robbed and calling the police like, somebody just took all my drugs. Like, what? Where did nah. he that? <laughs> Stabbed him the first time. They were even on the whole assassination attempt thing. So Cassius Clay should go to prison for mayhem. So Cassius Clay calls upon his older cousin, one of the best lawyers on the planet that had never lost an open court with over 40 years of experience, Henry Clay. Henry Clay goes into court and his entire defense for his cousin is, and I quote, Your Honor, this is just standard behavior for a Kentuckian. And the judge is just like, you're innocent. Free to go, that's it. It's Best valid. court case ever. Literally walks in and just goes, I thought this was America. Huh? Isn't this America? I'm sorry. 
I thought this was America. So after Cassius Clay was found innocent, Henry Clay decides that he's gonna run for president and Cassius is gonna help him campaign. Cassius is gonna tour the country giving speeches, saying, hey, you know, vote for my cousin. Here's the rule with that. Henry Clay told him he's only allowed to tour the northern states because he's actually legitimately concerned that if he sends Cassius to the south, he's gonna shoot so many fucking slave owners and duels that it could be considered voter fraud. So Henry Clay ends up losing the presidential That's election crazy. and Cassius moves on to his next life adventure, which is becoming an author and writing anti-slavery news articles. The problem with that was none of the newspapers were willing to publish him, so he says, fuck you, I'll start my own newspaper, The True American. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, starting an anti-slavery newspaper in Kentucky in 1845 was not very popular and his business would receive death threats pretty much every day, some of which were written in blood. So Cassius Clay, in true Cassius Clay fashion, says, it, I guess we're gonna fight about it. He then proceeds to up armor his entire business and his printing office. He covers the entire front of the office in a large iron sheet. He installs several cannons down corridors, stocks the entire thing with loaded guns, and rigs it to explode. Here's the thing, he also doesn't expect his em What is he, the Punisher? Like... <laughs> Yo, that sounds like an episode of The Punisher. Thing with loaded guns and rigs it to explode. Here's the thing, he also doesn't expect his employees to fight to the death for him, so he installs an escape hatch and instructs them to escape if anything goes down, because he's gonna fight the entire mob by himself. How's he gonna do that? As soon as you walk in the only door to get into that printing office, you find yourself in a long, narrow corridor with iron on each side, just wide enough for a single man to get through. Cassius Clay is gonna stand in that narrow corridor and fight the entire mob one man at a time literally the men i am not kidding you when i tell you this when i said it sounds like an episode of the punisher if you've seen daredevil the episode where the punisher is locked up that's exactly what happened in the jail cell this is probably where they got it from yo that's crazy. I thought we came from a world of like barbarians and such, and it seems like only a trinkle of them still like was in coming from, you know, that time up into the 1890s because he was just saying like all his other um, people were gonna flee off if he told them to. Yeah. And he's able to get away with all this stuff that he's able to do, and nobody's able to stop him. Well, I mean. When you him, you him. You know I'm what just I'm wondering like how it was back then. Were people really just afraid of a lot of things back then, or just not being able? Well, to... I mean, you got that same person get away with stuff like that today. Well, I mean, in a sense, I mean, a lot of the things that people go to jail for now is only because of technology. Like in the '80s, you could have shot somebody and got away with it pretty easy because there wasn't cameras everywhere, and the cameras that they did have were so terrible that. It wasn't like now you shoot somebody, there's a camera that the moment the gun go bang, the police are immediately alerted. They have cameras that start rolling in all of those areas. They got escape places, this, this, this. They, they got all that covered. So it's like, I think a lot of it just had to do with, you know, power, money, and like how you move. I mean, like, this guy gets shot and then fights six guys and still stabbed the guy who shot him. His daddy was a slave owner. That nigga had to be tough, you know? And he was against that. So you got to be extra tough. Like, you got to be the bully that bullies the bullies at that point. Because, you know, he was outnumbered. Everybody who's clearly in his circle or what he grew up around thought that way. He thought the opposite. So he going against the grain. Like he said, he was going to argue with anybody about anything at any given day. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. I'm gonna stand in that narrow corridor and fight the entire mob one man at a time. Literally the mentality of if you have a problem, take a number, I'll kill you in a minute. This man recreated the entire battle of fucking Thermopylae with 300 Spartans, except he's gonna do it all by himself. If you think fucking with John Wick's dog is a bad idea, the last thing you wanna do is fuck with Cassius Clay's printing press because this man is determined to defend the freedom of speech with the right to bear arms at yeah. any cost. Obviously, this escalates to Cassius Clay defeating an entire mob single-handedly, right? Wrong. The mob, being full of, you know, super brave pro-slavery men that know they're doing the right thing, do the honorable brave thing and wait till Cassius Clay is bedridden with typhoid fever so they know he isn't going to show up. They show up to his business at night and burn the place to the ground because they're a bunch of and bitches. Now, Cassius Clay recovers from typhoid fever. He reestablishes a newspaper in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is an anti-slavery stronghold. The only problem with that is being an anti-slavery stronghold, there's not going to be any conflict, and that's 
fucking boring, so Cassius Clay moves on to another life adventure, volunteering in the Mexican-American War. While serving in the Mexican-American War, he would be a captain leading a group of Kentucky soldiers, and they would be captured pretty much immediately, and he would spend the duration of the entire war as a POW. While serving as a POW, some of the men under his command would escape, meaning that the Mexican military was then going to put the rest of his unit to death. Cassius Clay said, hey, don't kill my men, just kill me and my other fellow officers, we're the ones in charge, it's our fault that those men escaped, it's our responsibility, please let the lower enlisted men go home. The Mexican military was so impressed by this that they decided to spare everyone, including Cassius Clay, and he would return home a war hero. Returning home from the war in 1848, he didn't really know what to do, so he starts giving his famous speeches again, this time leveraging his newfound title as a war hero. So obviously it doesn't take long for him to piss everybody off, he faces yet another assassination attempt. This time six brothers from a wealthy slave owning family show up, the Turner brothers. They show up with clubs and knives and guns, and they beat the living shit out of Cassius Clay with the clubs. They stabbed him multiple times. Cassius Clay whips out his trusted Bowie knife, starts opening up these brothers like they're f***ing Amazon packages, making his way to the lead brother and stabbing him an excessive amount of times. We don't know how many times, but we do know it was a lifetime supply. Killing the lead brother, ending the assassination attempt, Cassius Clay would fall to the ground nearly dead, and this would be the closest anybody ever came to actually killing Cassius Clay. When he was asked about it later on in life, all he said was, I felt the utmost indignation, which translates to, I was f***ing annoyed. This man almost died from an assassination attempt, and he has the same attitude towards it that I have towards f***ing fruit flies, okay? This <laughs> dude is so metal, he deserves his own spot on the periodic table of elements. Cassius Clay then makes a full recovery from his injuries, starts giving his speeches again. 1853, he donates a large chunk of his land to John Fee, who uses it to found Berea College, the first co-educational and multiracial college in the South ever. Fast forward to 1860, Cassius Clay is giving speeches in Illinois where he meets a politician by the name of Abraham Lincoln <laughs> and they get along great. <laughs> Cassius was. Clay is then slotted to become Abraham Lincoln's vice president. However, he's a little bit too Cassius Clay yeah. to be an actual big name politician like that. So they give the job to Hannibal Hamlin and Cassius Clay becomes the ambassador to Russia. 1861 rolls around, the Civil War breaks out. Cassius Clay is in Russia. Cassius Clay not only convinces Russia to not side with the Confederates, but he convinces Russia to tell Great Britain and France that if they so much as recognize the Confederacy, Russia will go to war with them. And this was a humongous step that nobody yeah. talks about in the winning of the Civil War. And it is 100% because because of Cassius Clay. Fast forward to 1862, Abraham Lincoln wants to appoint Clay a major general in the Union Army. Cassius Clay publicly refuses the President of the United States, saying that he's not going to do it until the President signs the Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves of the South. Cassius Clay is literally the man that bullied Abraham Lincoln into prematurely signing the Emancipation Proclamation before he wanted to and nobody talks about it. Fast forward again to 1865, the Union wins the Great American Scrimmage, the slaves are freed. Cassius Clay has achieved his lifelong goal at the age of 55, bringing an end to slavery in the United States of America. He then goes back to Russia again to serve as ambassador until 1869, and while he is there, he helps to broker the purchase of Alaska. This man is probably the most influential person in American history that you've never heard of. Yeah. After returning home from Russia, Cassius Clay would live out the rest of his days in Whitehall until the age of 80 years old, where he would be declared clinically insane in hindsight, most likely due to a severe amount of PTSD, as well as potentially dementia. Uh, he didn't die from it, he lived on for quite a bit longer, he just picked up a new hobby of f***ing with the local sheriff because he was crazy now. Over the course of the next decade, Clay and the sheriff would have multiple run-ins that would be concluded when the sheriff and seven deputies were repelled from Whitehall when Clay utilized his home defense cannon that he had at the top of his stairwell. At that point, what? the local sheriff would inform the local judge he will not be returning to Whitehall to tangle with Cassius Clay anymore unless the judge was willing to dispatch an entire company of the local militia to accommodate him. Then in 1900, two men would break into Whitehall and Cassius Clay at the age of 89 would manage to kill both of them, one by gunshot and one yet again with his trusted Bowie knife. Then in 1903, at the age of 92, Cassius Clay would die of natural causes, or as they called it back then, general exhaustion, which is the most gangster way on the planet to go out. Literally just, I'm tired now, peace. And then he left. <laughs> I'm pretty tired, I think yeah. I'll go home now.
In conclusion, when it comes to famous historical household names, there's always another man or woman lurking behind the scenes in the shadows that's deemed too rough around the edges to be in the spotlight, yet they contribute just as much, if not more, Facts. to the movement. These men and women are willing to do horrific things for terrific reasons. And when it came to Abraham Lincoln and the abolition of slavery, that man's name was Cassius Marcellus Clay, the most gangster politician in American history. Thanks for watching the video. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. Always tell me to wait. I waited and nothing happened. Look at you. Look at you. Drop a like, dog. I was fired. My boy is a crazy boy. You know what I'm saying? I support that. Always some good knowledge in my noggin. I love it. Yeah. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Roll to 50K. Let's get it.